Okay, so now that the recording has begun, let's talk a little bit about chapter 12, which covers mass spectrometry and infra infrared spectroscopy. So what is the motivation behind these chapters on structure elucidation? Well, to analyze the outcome of a reaction, we need to know the full structure of the products as well as the reactants. So one of the methods used to get a rough sense of the structure and overall mass of our reactant and product is mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry can be divided into multiple categories based on whether we're dealing with small or large molecules and depending on the type of ionization used. So depending on the molecule size and functional groups, different methods of ionization are utilized in mass spectrometry. There is soft ionization, which involves addition or loss of H plus to generate ions with minimal fragmentation. This is primarily applied to larger molecules or molecules with ionizable functional groups. And the more traditional hard ionization, which is primarily done via electron impact. And oftentimes we see appreciable amounts of fragmentation and rearrangement. Now, essentially the way that mass spec works is we take our sample, we ionize our sample, and then once we have generated our fragment ions, we detect and we determine the mass over charge of our fragment ions. So in terms of the first step, which is ionization, the most common method that you'll see in this course and that you'll see in the spectra collected in the laboratory is electron impact, where electrons are passed over a wire filament and accelerated and then they impact our molecules dispersed in the, glass, in the gas phase and that generates fragment ions and molecular ions. The other two methods commonly seen are electrospray ionization and matrix absorption, matrix assisted la sorry, laser desorption ionization or MALDI, uh, essentially where you have your sample on a substrate, you shine a UV laser on the substrate and that substrate facilitates ionization of your substrate in the matrix. And as a result, you generate ions. This is typically used for soft ionization or ionization of larger molecules. In terms of once you've generated your ions, so all of these methods, they either generate parent ions or fragments. We next have to analyze and determine the mass over charge of each of our parent ions and fragments. And there are two main methods, the first of which is time of flight, where we measure the time it takes for the ions to reach the detector in a defined field. And the other option is quadrupole separation, where ions within a specified range can pass through the mass selective filter, and by scanning across a range of masses, we can detect the ions from a range of different masses and determine the amount of ions of each mass in our, in our fragmented sample. So let's look at a picture of how mass spectrometry works and what is actually being measured. So for small molecules, the main use of mass spectrometry is first to get a sense of molecular weight. So your sample is vaporized and subject to bombardment with high energy electrons, and that removes a valence electron to make a radical cation. So your organic molecule, which is dispersed in the gas phase, is impacted with electrons. That in turn generates, so we have our organic molecule MH, that in turn generates a radical cation. And this is called our parent ion. Okay, once we've ionized, once we've ionized our sample, 
that sample can then undergo further fragmentation. So our parent ion, MH plus, can undergo further fragmentation to yield fragment ions. Some fragments are neutral, while some fragments are charged. And once we have our fragment and parent ions generated from ionization, those ions are then separated and detected based on their mass to charge. So M over Z refers to the mass over charge ratio. And in most cases for small molecules, this can be approximated to the mass of the ion. Okay, so we ionize our sample. It can either break apart into fragments or stay together primarily as a parent ion. And we detect each of the fragments and our parent ion and we measure their mass. So in the end, the main thing to take away from mass spectrometry is we're measuring the mass to charge of our original parent compound and its parent ion and the fragments. Does that make sense? Does that idea make sense in terms of what we're fundamentally measuring? Okay, perfect. So, by plotting the mass of ions in terms of mass over charge versus the intensity of the signal, which corresponds to the number of ions detected, yes, the mass is of the ion itself. Yep. So when we plot the mass of our ion, versus the number of ions of that mass, that gives us what's known as a mass spectrum. So the tallest peak is known as the base peak and other peaks are listed as a percentage of that peak. So for example, in this case, this largest peak would be our base peak. The peak that corresponds to our unfragmented radical cation is known as the parent peak or the molecular ion M plus. So this would be our parent peak because for propane, it has a molecular mass of 44 and the parent peak has the same mass of 44. Does that idea make sense? So the parent peak is the unfragmented radical cation our base peak is the largest peak. Any questions so far? Okay, so in terms of interpreting mass spectra, mass spectra provides us an extremely accurate molar mass of our sample. So we can get a, so I see a question in the chat, what does the base peak represent? The base peak is just the most abundant fragment ion or most abundant ion observed. It's just the, the ion that's most present of the ions observed during fragmentation and ionization. So when you observe the mass of your parent peak and base peaks, mass spectra can provide you an extremely precise molar mass for your parent and fragment ions. And because we're able to report our mass to a large number of decimal places and to a very high level of precision, we can distinguish between two compounds with very similar molar masses. So a molecular mass of 72 is ambiguous, but 72.0939 and 72.0575 are distinguishable. So if you carefully calculate your molar masses from the atomic masses, you can very precisely differentiate between two almost identical formulas. 
So the main thing I want you to take away, your molar mass must be calculated to the maximum amount of allowed significant figures. So carbon 12.011, hydrogen 1.0079. You should use as many sig figs as possible from the atomic masses given in the periodic table when performing your calculations. Does that make sense? Perfect. So there are a few other features of a mass spectra. First, uh, you may not always see your parent ion. So for in, the, in this case, especially with electron impact, your parent ion is missing. So for 2,2-dimethylpropane, which looks something like this, you do not see your parent ion. Your parent ion is not present. Instead, we see this fragment ion with mass over charge of 57, which corresponds to the following cation. This has the formula of C4H9, which as we notice is 12 times four plus nine, which is 57. So under electron impact, you may not see your parent ion. Does that idea make sense? Um, where did you get this the C4H9 formula? Ah, um, so the molar mass of 57 matches a structure with four carbons and nine hydrogens. Because if you add up the molar mass of four carbon atoms and nine hydrogens, you get 57. Oh, so, so we have to figure that out ourselves. Yes, and I'll talk more about how to figure out your fragment formula in a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank um, you. Intuitively, you can also think of fragmentation as the breaking of bonds. And the bond that would give a very stable cation would be breaking this carbon-carbon bond, right? Because we have this nice, very stable tertiary carbocation. And that's partially why in this structure you only really see this major fragment ion and you don't see your parent ion. Does that idea make sense? Yeah. So the next thing I want us to focus on, the next thing I want us to pay attention to are these small peaks above the molar mass of our parent ion. These are known as M plus one peaks and they're the result of carbon 13 present naturally in our sample. And a small percentage of our sample will be enriched in carbon-13. And that's why we see a small percentage of our parent ion peak and all of our peaks for that matter, exhibit this tiny M plus one peak. Does everyone see this tiny peak called the M plus one peak? Now this is important because it can serve as a tool to estimate the number of carbon atoms in our sample. So let's take a look at that. So the first thing we need to think about is how to interpret fragmentation. So the centerpiece of mass spectral analysis is this idea that when molecular ions break down, they will generate characteristic fragments. And in general, the positive charge will go to fragments that best stabilize that charge. So if we had to fragment this, this T-butyl functional group and we wanted to break one of our bonds, where would we prefer to put the positive charge? On a tertiary carbon or a primary carbon? Which site gives us a more stable carbocation? The tertiary. Yep, exactly right. The tertiary carbocation is very stable. And that is why this T-butyl fragment is often going to be especially pronounced in fragmentation patterns. Stable carbocations generally yield very large fragment peaks. So I want you to impress on 
impressing this idea that stability of carbocation, the stability of your carbocation is proportional to peak intensity. This is a good guideline to think about and to keep in mind as we start to piece together our structures. Now, the second thing I want you to sort of approach mass, spec mass spectrometry with is this idea that we have known spectra for many, many compounds. And we can often identify compounds by comparison with the literature. Further, if it's an unknown compound, the main goal for mass spectrometry is twofold. One, it gives us the molar mass and the formula. And two, it gives us the approximate structure. And three, it can distinguish between structures. Mass spectrometry alone is often not used sole, as the sole source of structural assignment. It's coupled with other methods. But if you're really careful and you're really deliberate with how you analyze a spectra, you can get a very, very close to perfect assignment of the structure. What I'm looking for you, especially in this class, is to be able to use as a tool to get the molar mass and formula and to begin to approximate the structure. There are some cases where you can tell structures apart, and we'll look at a few of those examples in a moment. Does that make sense to everyone, how to approach mass spectrometry and the, the theoretical basis that underpins mass spectrometry? The peak height is based on carbocation stability. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Okay, so let's, let's look at some examples. And let's look at a sample fragmentation of hexane. So if we think about hexane, so hexane has six carbons, okay? Hexane has a formula of C6H14. So if we think about C6H14, that gives us a molar mass of six times 12 plus 14, and that in turn gives us a molar mass of 86. That's where we see our parent ion with a mass of 86. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Does everyone see where I got 86 from? From the formula and the molar mass. Okay, yes. we see a major peak at 57. This is going to be our base peak. Okay, now, when you think about fragmentation, by definition, we are breaking bonds in our molecule. So what you can do is you can think about different places to cut your molecule, different bonds to break, and what fragments you would make. So 57, what for, what, what, what did, when we looked at 57 before, we knew it corresponded to a general formula of C4H9 because 12, times four plus nine gives us 57. So this mass of 57 typically corresponds to some form of a butyl group. Likewise, so let's try to cut this molecule in a way that we get a butyl group. Let's try to cut this molecule in a way that we get a butyl group. One, two, three, four, five, six. So let's cut so we end up with a four carbon chain, right? So we end up with our butyl cation, which has the formula C4H9 and a mass over charge of 57. Does that make sense? Does everyone see where from this formula we get 57? And does everyone see that we can get a butyl side chain by cutting and breaking this bond? Does that make sense? Now, my question to you is what's left over? What, what, what's left over when we break this bond? What group is left over? Another group? Uh, 
methyl or ethyl? Oh, methyl. Sorry, is that M or E? Uh, one M? or two carbons? Oh, two, two carbons. Two, yep. So we have an ethyl cation, and this has a formula of C2H5. Now, this is maybe a good time to break out your calculators, and I'd like you to tell me, what is the mass to charge of this ethyl cation? What is the mass of this ethyl cation, in other words? 29, exactly, because we have 12 times 2 plus 5, and that gives us 29. So from our original, from our original parent ion with a mass over charge of 86, we broke a bond and fragmented it into two fragment ions. Now, do you notice how if you add up 29 and 57, if you add up the mass is found in these two peaks, you end up getting, so 57 plus 29, you end up getting 86. I call these related fragments. If two fragments can be put together to get back to your parent ion, that is really important to look for in mass spectrometry because it can help you get a sense of how these bonds are connected and which fragments are connected to each other. Does everyone see how if we put these two fragments back together, we go back to our parent ion? Does everyone see how we broke a bond, we got some fragments, we can just as easily put them back together? Now, you may ask, where do we get this 43 from? Well, if we have a six carbon chain, we can also cut it. We can also generally cut it straight down the middle, right? And that would give us two propyl fragments of the formula C3H7. What is the mass to charge of this propyl fragment? Forty-three. Yep, exactly right. So, as you can see, we can account for the presence of each of these three peaks, and this is a characteristic pattern associated with hexanes. Now, my question to all of you is, and this is a pretty important point to consider, why do we not see very much 15? Why don't we see a cut here? What's a problem with that? What's a, what's a big problem with this fragmentation pattern? Why don't we see it very often? Is there a carbocut ion on the primary carbon? Yep, and it's, it's worse than primary even because it's a methyl carbocation. And are those very stable? No. No. They're even less stable than primary because you don't even get a single interaction via hyperconjugation. So as a result, you're very unlikely to make methyl carbocations. Does that make sense? So the stability of each of your carbocations directly relates to the peak height. Does that make sense? Can you say that again? The stability of your carbocation is directly proportional to your peak height and abundance. And because a methyl carbocation is so unstable, we often don't see methyl carbocations in our mass spectra. Does that make sense? And that's yes. why we, yes, please go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, I was saying yes. Oh, okay, perfect. So let's look at some additional data that we can take in and utilize. And that comes from the mass plus one peak. The mass plus one peak or the M plus one peak allows us fundamentally to estimate the number of carbon atoms in our sample. So 
The M plus one peak comes from carbon 13 or deuterium that is randomly present in our sample. And again, don't be shy if you have a question to unmute or if you have any comments to unmute. I have a question. Yes. So um, how did you calculate the M to um, Z ratio? Ah, the mass to charge ratio, it's just calculating the molar mass. So if we yeah. have three carbons, it's... it would be 12 times three. And if we have seven hydrogens, we add seven. Yeah, so we have it's 30... 40. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly right. And then, and then the charge would be? Just one. Plus two? Oh, just one, okay. Because we look at each fragment individually. Oh, each fragment, okay. Yep. All right, thank Most you. Cases for small molecules, mass to charge is equivalent to the mass of the fragment. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. So when, when you look at any set of peaks, especially your parent ion peak, the mass plus one peak comes from carbon 13 that's randomly present in your sample. And carbon 13 is roughly 1.1% of all carbon atoms in nature, thankfully for that matter, or make other spectroscopic methods really problematic. Um, you would expect to see an M plus one peak, roughly 1.1% the size of the parent peak for a one carbon molecule. Now, the more carbons we have, the more potential abundance of carbon 13 we can have, right? So for each carbon in our molecule, the M plus one peak increases in height. So the mass plus one peak height is proportional to the number of carbon atoms times 1.1%. So for example, decane, which has 10 carbons, would have an M plus one peak percent equal to 10 times 1.1, which gives us approximately 11%. So for decane, we'd see our main peak, our parent peak, and we'd see the M plus one peak, which is roughly 11% of the height. So based on the height of the M plus one peak, we can estimate the number of carbon atoms. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that idea make sense? Can you say that again? So the height of the M plus one peak allows you to determine the number of carbon atoms. Okay. The exact percentage of the M plus one peak is equal to the number of carbon atoms times 1.1. So if we have 10 carbon atoms, the M plus one peak would be 11% of the main peak height. Does okay, that make got sense? it. Yeah. Perfect. So let's talk about some new peaks that we call the M plus two peak. So there are two main cases. First is chlorine. Chlorine consists of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 with chlorine 35 being the major isotope at 75% abundance. Thus, if you have a chlorine atom, you see an M plus two peak, roughly 25% of the height. So looking at this spectra, does this remind us of a chlorine containing compound? Do we see a 75-25 ratio? So looking here. No. No, we don't. So this doesn't have chlorine in it. So then that begs the question, what does it have? What is present in this sample? Well, bromine consists of bromine 79 and 81 with both isotopes having 50% abundance in nature. Thus, you see an M plus two peak with equal height to the parent ion peak if your compound contains bromine. So do you, as everyone knows how the M and M plus two peak are equal in height, this tells us very clearly we have what? Bromine. Bromine. Bromine, yep. Now, another piece of information we can take away, uh, notice how the M plus peak has a mass of 108 and our fragment has a mass 
the fragment has a mass to charge of 29. So our delta, our difference, 108 minus 29, what does that give us? 79. 79. And yes, and why is that 79 important? What does that match the loss of? The bromine 79. Yep, exactly. So anytime you see a difference between a parent peak and a fragment peak of 79, that's strong evidence you may have bromine in your sample. Does that make sense? And putting it together, we have this fragment with a mass of 29. What does that fragment correspond to? 29, where'd we see that before? If we think about like an ethyl cation, what's the mass over charge of this ethyl cation? C2. It would be 29. Yep, exactly. So we have this ethyl cation. We have bromine. So putting them together, we have our ethyl cation and bromine. Putting them together, that gives us bromoethane. So this spectra matches that of bromoethane. So as you can see, by analyzing the fragments already, we can start to piece together reasonable structures for our compounds. Does that make sense? Does that analysis make sense? How we recognize 29 corresponds to an ethyl group. And if we put them together, we get bromoethane. And as we notice, if we look at the mass of bromoethane, 29 plus 79 gives us 108. Professor? Yes, please go ahead. Um, if we took that one, for example, the M, and if we took it at the 110, like subtract it to 29, it will correspond to the BR812, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It In general, when you do the analysis, try to focus on the highest intensity peaks when you're dealing with halogens. Um, because depending on whether you fragment off bromine 79 or 81, as you see, you also have this minor fragment peak. Right. Um, in general, the reason why I chose to focus on this 29 fragment is it's the most easily recognizable and rationalized fragment. Um, you may wonder what this 27 is coming from. Um, that's like a vinyl type fragment that occurs through a more complicated fragmentation process. Um, almost like an elimination process. Um, in general, I try to focus on the most easily recognized alkyl fragments first before looking at the minor fragments. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Um, so you said like to for from like between M and M plus do you we have to like look at the, which one is the highest peak? Yes. And the fact that M and M plus two are equal in height, that tells us bromine is present because these two, these, the M and M plus two peaks are almost equal in height, which corresponds to the fact that both bromine isotopes are roughly equal in abundance. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Now let's look at an interesting example. In this case, we see our M and M plus two peak. The M plus two peak is roughly 25% of the height of the main parent peak. What does that tell us? What, what do we have present in the sample? Chlorine. Yep, exactly right. And now we also tell that if we have a mass of 112 and our fragment has a mass of 70, mass over charge of 77, the difference between these, so looking at our delta, 112 minus 77 gives us 35, so our delta is equal to 35, and that tells us that we lost a chlorine atom. Now, this is an important telltale mass over charge signature, and it actually relates to what we covered in chapter 15. Um, 77, 77, what does that remind everyone of? 77, I'll give you a hint. What's the mass of C6H3? 
C6H5. What's the mass of C6H5? Seventy-seven. Yep, exactly. So this mass over charge of seventy-seven is typically benzene. corresponds to a uh, not quite. Oh, well, sorry. Yeah, yeah. A, a phenyl a phenyl cation. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, benzene would be C six H six, but yeah, uh, yeah. The the idea is perfect is perfectly correct. So commonly, when you have phenyl groups, you'll see this characteristic mass over charge of seventy-seven. But yes, your idea is, is spot on. Exactly right. Um, so this is an important mass over charge signature to remember. And because aromatic rings are quite stable, they don't generally fragment all that well. Do you notice how this is a pretty major fragment peak? Another feature of aromatic systems, um, they don't, you generally see a pretty pronounced parent ion if it's directly attached to your aromatic ring. So then putting together our two fragments, we have our phenyl cation and we have chloride, putting them together, that gives us chlorobenzene. And this has a molar mass of 112. Now, of course, these assignments are tentative. They're pretty good because the spectra are so simple for now. When you get to more complicated spectra, then, so there, then there's some ambiguity, and we often have to rely on additional structural tests. Um, but for these compounds, since they only, have, they only have two carbons or they have very defined ring structures, it's pretty easy to assign a tentative arrangement of atoms. Does that make sense? Did that answer the question in the chat? Generally, it's prudent to do more tests, but we've been able to get a lot of information from what we're presented with already. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Um, I'm confused on where you got the chlorine when you first looked at the diagram. Ah, so yeah. remember how chlorine 35 and chlorine 37, chlorine 35 is major at 75%, and chlorine 37 is minor. Do you notice how the minor M plus two peak is roughly a quarter of the height of the main peak? Yeah, yeah. This signature where the M plus two peak is a quarter of the height tells us uh -huh. we have a chlorine in our sample. Oh, okay. So if it looks like it's, it's about a quarter of the, of yep. the M yep. height, it's, it's chlorine, okay. Okay. Or at least one chlorine is present. That's the, that's the better way of phrasing it. And you can also verify that by the fact you'll see this characteristic spacing equal to the mass of chlorine, right? We lose a chlorine, we lose 35 from our parent mass. So if there was more than one chlorine present, You'd see would it, it be like, indicated as like a higher mass or higher separation or would it be two different separations. You'd see two different separations and also this peak height ratio would get a little bit, it'll, it'll look a little bit different because okay. you'd have, you'd, you'd see four peaks, right? Because at, for any given chlorine atom, you can either have two heavy, two light and combinations of the two. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Um, you don't commonly see it, but you'd see something that looks like something like this. Oh, the, okay. Yeah, because this, you'd have like light, light and heavy, 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 light, light. And I'm not sure the exact ratio. Um, if you have multiple chlorines, you'd still see something that looks very close to this pattern. And that would be a sign. I have one chlorine. But if you see multiple steps, multiple losses of chlorine, that's a good signpost to say there may be multiple chlorines here and we can clearly see that via the loss of chlorine in our mass spectra. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, thank you. Any other questions on this? So when you talk about analyzing fragments given the formula, if you're given the formula, 
the main thing to do is to write out the parent ion and start trying to break carbon-carbon bonds and drawing the resulting fragments. From there, you can match each fragment to the observed mass to charge. Generally, the more stable the fragment, the larger the observed fragment peak. Now, if you aren't given a lot of detail in the formula, it's often best to approach what is known as the retrosynthetic approach, where first you find the parent ion and you determine the mass to charge of your fragment ions. Next, you form a bond between two fragments to give a larger fragment, and you check to see if your new fragment mass to charge is observed. You then repeat this process of sticking your fragments together until the parent mass over charge is observed. Now, I've made some space in the notes for you to include some common fragment masses. I put a few here to start your organizational structure. Uh, we noted a few more. So we know C6H5 has a mass over charge of 77. And I really want you to use this section in the notes to add things that you encounter. Um, does anyone have any suggestions for us to add to this table? Any other common fragment masses that we encountered that we'd like to include? Any common fragments that we saw that we want to note just for our reference? I was going to say 43, yep. but I think that's what you just wrote. Yep. Okay, yeah. Uh, what else? Yep, chlorine. Though you don't typically directly observe the chloride ion. Yep, chlorine, bromine. Though you don't typically you don't typically directly observe either of these because they're anions. Um, what about like a like a butyl fragment? What's a butyl cation C4H9? What's that mass? Fifty-seven. Yep. So you can feel free to add to this table as we continue to solve problems. And the faster you are at recognizing common mass over charge signatures, the easier it is to put together a viable spectra. Okay, so when you're given a mass spectra, this is the first thing you should do. When you find your parent ion peak, you can estimate the number of carbon ions in your parent ion and your fragments immediately. Now this is based on this idea that for a common saturated hydrocarbon, it has the formula CnH2n plus two, right? So in other words, we can figure out based on the number of carbons n, we can write an expression for the mass where the mass is 12 times the number of carbons plus two times the number of carbons plus two. Now this minus one term, you subtract one if you're dealing with a fragment. If it's the parent ion, you just leave this equation as is. So only include this minus one term if you're dealing with a fragment. Um, just to show an example of this, so C3H8 is a common formula for propane, right? And what is the molar mass of propane? What is the mass of propane? Just uh, 44. So we have 12 times three plus eight. So that gives us, yep, 44. Yep. If we're dealing with a propyl fragment, however, we subtract one and that gives us 43. Now to show how this, to show how this is obtained using this formula here, so our mass in this case would be 12 times the number of carbons, which is three, plus two times the number of carbons, which is three plus two, which gives us 44. So this formula allows you to calculate the mass 
for any number of carbons. And from this, you can match your observed mass to the mass calculated for the number of carbons using this formula. You can also solve it algebraically for that matter. Does that make sense to everyone so far? And I guess if you wanted to, to solve it algebraically, the number of carbons would just be the mass minus two over 14. Yeah. Does this idea of estimating the number of carbons make sense? Why is it 14? Ah, because uh, 12 plus 2 gives us 14, as we can merge these variables together, right? Because why, why are we doing 2 and not just 1 hydrogen? Sorry, uh, like, isn't uh, it just the mass of carbon plus the mass of hydrogen is 13? Uh, yes, but the, the general formula for a hydrocarbon is CnH2n plus 2, right? So for every um, carbon, okay. we have 2 times the number of carbons plus 2, right? So like using C3H8 as an example, just to show how this would work, the number of carbons would be equal to the mass, which is 44 minus 2 over 14. That gives us 42 over 14, which gives us 3 carbons. This assumes no double bonds or rings. Um, the reason why this 14 term and this minus two term are present is for any saturated compound, a saturated hydrocarbon, it has the following general formula. Does that okay. make sense? So that formula is strictly for saturated compounds? Yes, yes. Gotcha, that makes sense. You can calculate the mass for any saturated compound and you can, in turn, from the mass and by comparing to your observed parent ion or fragment mass, you can estimate the number of carbons in your parent or fragment. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Now, yes. yes. I have one quick question. Um, we were taught and for the parent um, fraction of the, the number, we divide it by 13 and have it on the mixed number as a mixed number fraction. Is there any way that it's not applicable? Like, is there any circumstances that it's not applicable? Divide by 13 and use a, fra a fraction? So we would take the highest M peak, and then if there was chlorine or bromine present, we would subtract 35, and then we would divide that number by 13. And then whatever we would get, like the mixed number fraction you have right there, like the whole number would be the number of carbons, and then the number over 13 would be the number of hydrogens. Oh, I guess that works. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't see a reason why it wouldn't if, if, it, if, if it was done with a variety of, of examples. Sure, that's, that, I can't think of a, I can't see a case where I would run into problems. Uh, the reason why I use this method is because it handles also un, unsaturated compounds as well. Um, and for that, uh, this is a good lead into this next idea. If your mass is two, four, six, eight, or a multiple of two less than the saturated chain mass, then you can calculate the DU by taking the saturated mass minus the observed mass. So suppose you're, you're given a molar mass or a mass over charge of your parent ion of 40. We can calculate the DU by comparing our observed mass to a saturated mass. So our saturated formula would be C3H8, which has a mass of 44. So our DU or degree of unsaturation would be 44 minus 40 over two, which gives us a DU of two. That tells us we have four less that tells us we have four less hydrogen. So we'd have a formula of C3 H4. And that tells us we have two double bonds or a ring present in some combination. Does this idea of calculating DU using this, the observed mass and the calculated saturated mass make sense? 
I'm so sorry. Could you explain where you got the 40 from? Uh, this is just an arbitrary number. This is just an arbitrary number as an example. Let's say we observed a mass over charge of 40. It doesn't oh, okay. match C3H8 directly, right? It's not a perfect match, but it's close. So we think then that there is likely unsaturation present, that there is likely a double bond or ring that results in less observed hydrogens in our structure. From that, we can figure out the du by taking the saturated mass minus the observed mass that we see for our parent ion divided by two. That gives us a du of two, and that tells us we have a formula of C3H4. Does that make sense? So you just chose 44 because it's the closest, the closest. mass. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, we had yeah we had a different formula, but it makes sense the way you said it too. Okay, perfect. So then, now that we have approximate formulas for our parent ion and fragments, we draw a carbon skeleton for each fragment and parent ion, and we check the fragment ions are stable as predicted for major fragment ions. Remember peak intensity is proportional to cation stability. So you have to make sure that your assignments are reasonable with that in mind. So let's look at a practical example. Now, here's the part where I just want to preface this where if you see something like this on an exam, I'm not going to expect you to get a perfect structural assignment. What I am going to expect is coupled with other information, you should be able to narrow down a list of plausible structures. And then the more information I provide, the more accurate your structure should become. So looking at this case, um, this is a little bit of a tricky example actually. Um, and let's talk about the kind of analysis that I'd want to see from you on an exam and the kind of analysis you should do when you're looking at a spectra for the first time in lab. So first we know this compound does not have a ring and it may have a double bond, okay? So with that in mind, what's the first thing we look for? What, what have I been emphasizing throughout? What's the first thing we focus on? Aaron ion. Parent ion, exactly right. So this gives us a mass to charge of 98. Okay, so 98. So using, using our estimation, we know that if we had seven carbons, for example, that would have a mass of six times 12 plus two times 12 plus two, 72, oh, whoops. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Seven times 12 plus seven times two. Remember, we plug in the number of carbons into our formula. That gives us an estimated mass of 84, 98, 100. So C7H16, which is our saturated compound, has a formula, has, has a formula of C7H16 and a mass of 100. 98 is pretty close to that, right? Does everyone see how it's how this mass over charge of 98 is pretty close to 100, which matches C7H16? Does everyone see that parallel? So, Professor, um, how did you get 7C? Like, how did you know it was going to have seven carbons? Oh, I just, I, I, I guessed. If you guessed six, for example, you'd get yeah. six times 12 plus two times six plus two and you would get 72, 84, 86. Okay. And if you guessed eight carbons, you'd have eight times 12 plus two times eight plus two. So we'd have okay. six plus 16, which gives us 114. So as we see, of these potential carbon counts, seven carbons is the closest match. Oh, okay, I see now. Yeah, it's closest to 98. 
And then from that, we can calculate the du by taking 100 minus 98 over two, and that gives us a du of one. That tells us we have two less hydrogens and one double bond or a ring. So we have a tentative formula of C7H14. Does everyone get that first step? Does that first step where we figured out our formula make sense? Any questions? So you just subtracted two hydrogens? Yep, because a du of one tells us we have two hydrogens less. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. And you can also tell that by because the difference in masses is the amount of hydrogens missing for a hydrocarbon. And since our difference is two, we've lost two, we've lost two hydrogens. You can also verify that because the mass of C7H14 directly matches 98. Does that make sense? I did it a second. Oh yes, please go ahead. I did it a slightly different way. I did it using your estimated number of carbons formula that you came up yep. with earlier. Yep. And I just, I got seven carbons. And then from there, I, I, I subtracted the mass of uh, the seven carbons. And then from the M plus peak, the parent peak. Yep. And I got 14 hydrogens and I got C7H14. Yep. That, that, that's also perfectly that's my method of getting yep. there. If, if you use the formula, if, it, if your compound has unsaturation, the number may be slightly off. Um, so the, the, but the formula does work to give you the, the, the closest number of carbons, which, in, which is seven. Um, so both methods do work. Often for analyzing mass spectra, whatever method you're most comfortable with in using to calculate masses is the one that you should prefer to use as you really want to free up as much of the, as much headspace as possible for thinking about not just what, not just what is this fragment's formula, but why is this fragment peak so large? But yes, there, that is also a perfectly valid approach and it's good to, good to see students applying it. Any other questions on this? Um, one quick question, Professor. Whenever on the test or homework, probably, when we get this question, are we expected to also draw the structure of the C7H14? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about next how to do that. Um, so in terms of like bare minimum, this is where you should be able to get to 100% unambiguously. So you should be able to get the formula with no issues. This next part is where you may need more information or it may require um, a very careful analysis. So I'll often ask you to get it right and draw a general formula and justify your answer, but I'm not expecting you to get the formula perfect for these sort of open-ended examples in problem sets. Um, you'll see an example of an exam-like question later on in this chapter. Um, but let's continue our analysis for now and let's talk about some key points here. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna identify our major peaks. So let's identify our peaks. So we have a mass over charge of 83. Now, the, the one thing I always like to, to use is the, what I like to call the rule of 14 or rule of 15. In general, you'll always see losses and in increments of 15, 14, 29 because this 15 corresponds to like a methyl group. Um, so often you'll see your peaks divided by 14, 15, or 29 because you can lose methyl, ethyl, et cetera. Okay, we see a giant peak with a mass over charge of 69. Um, that's a bit unusual. That should already be a red flag. Um, next, we see two peaks, one of which has a mass over charge of 56 and a mass over charge of 55. And then we see a peak with a mass over charge of 41 and a peak with a mass over charge of 29. Okay, so uh, our first order of business is to identify our, we've identified our parent peak and we have our base peak, okay? Our base peak is our most stable, most abundant ion. 
Now, my question to all of you is, this mass over charge of 69 is related to what other peak? What is a connected or related peak? 69 plus what gives us 98? The 29 peak. 29, yep. So then I'm going to circle these two peaks. These are known as related peaks. Another thing that I'd like you to note, we see this mass over charge of 27, which we previously identified as, as like a vinyl cation of some sort. Mass over charge 29, do we know what that is? Mass over charge 29, does that look familiar to us? What is that? That is the ethyl yep, cation. Ethyl. Yep, okay. So we have the following pieces of information. We know the mass over charge of 29, that tells us we have an ethyl cation. The mass over charge of 69, we have no clue what it is for right now, but we know we came from an original formula of C7H14, right? And if we break off into our two fragments, right, and we lost C2H5, whoops, one moment, let me reset. Sorry, sometimes Zoom gets overloaded when I have screen sharing up. Okay. Okay, so let's go, let's return back to our original point of related peaks, right? So we started with our original C7H14. And this C7H14 has a mass over charge of 98, right? So we know we have an ethyl fragment, which has a formula of C2H5. So by definition, if we broke this off from C7H14, what is the formula of our other fragment? This is an important time-saving measure. C5H9? Yep, exactly right, C5H9. Do you notice how these both add up to C7H14? So then, C5H9, let's think about this. If it was saturated, it would have the formula of C5H11 plus. So we know that we have a DU of 71 minus 69 over two. So we have a DU of one. That makes sense so far, right? If we start with a DU of one, our fragments generally should have unsaturation, right? One of our fragments should be unsaturated, right? Does that make sense to everyone so far? Where we got this fragment formula from and where we got the DU from? Does that part make sense? Yes. Okay, perfect. So now from here, we're gonna have to do a little bit more thinking on this. So let's note that this C5H9 is a huge peak, okay? So what plausible formulas could we have for C5H9? There are many. Um, I'm just gonna draw. So we can have something like this, right? And presumably we'd have our cation at the vinylic position, right? The other option would be something like this, okay? The other options for constitutional isomers would be something like this. And of course you can have your cation at any of these three positions. Okay. So the next question that we have to deal with is Looking at these cations, is there any particular cation that stands out in terms of stability? Is there any particular cation that stands out in terms of stability? I think the one on the top left, A, 
Uh, a, okay, so we'd have a secondary vinylic. Perfectly reasonable guess. Um, so let's compare. Let's look at C and D and let's draw some resonance structures. So for C, we can generate a resonance structure that looks something like this, okay? Uh, for D, we generate a resonance structure that looks something like this. So looking at these resonance structures now, which of these four structures gives us the most potentially stable carbocation? Would it be D? D, yep. So then, all of these are reasonable options. We can't necessarily preclude any of them just yet. Um, but since we have this giant peak with mass over charge 69, it looks like D is the most viable potential structure. Does that train of thought make sense to everyone? Does everyone see why D is relatively preferred? And does everyone see why D is such a major cation if it were generated? Okay, so continuing on, so we know that we have a formula of C7H14. We have this ethyl cation fragment with 29. We have something with a mass of a charge of 41, something with a mass of a charge of 55. I'm just repeating what we've, what we've already established. 83, 98. Okay, so we established that this breaks down into two related peaks. The first of which is our ethyl cation, and the second of which has a formula of C5H9 plus. It has a DU of one. That is why we drew a double bond. DU of one, double bond. Does that make sense? Now you may ask, why didn't we draw a ring? Why didn't we draw a ring? We have a DU of one. Why is a ring not okay? There's not enough um, carbons. Uh, let's let's focus with the 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 sim. You can draw a ring with the number of carbons you have, but looking at the problem, what does it tell us? Uh, why why can't we draw? It says it doesn't have a ring. Yeah, the, the compound doesn't have a ring. So this is just an important idea to bring up in that the problem constraints should always be considered when you're working through. Um, because oftentimes then you can run into issues where you're drawing a billion structures when in reality the problem has been designed in a way where less structures are possible. Does that make sense to everyone? Always something to keep in mind, especially on exams. If a question seems tricky, um, make sure to check that there isn't a hint or further instruction. Okay, so C5H9, we have a range of viable structures and we really thought this structure looked good. Okay, so now that we have our two fragment pieces, now that we have our two fragment pieces, all we have to do is join our fragments together. There we go. Uh, whoops, whoops, not quite. There we go, perfect. So this gives us something with a formula of C7H14. Now, are we done? Are we done? Have we fully explored this spectra? Does this look like a reasonable guess? I guess is another way of phrasing it. Does this look like a reasonable guess to everyone? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. this would be perfectly okay. Um, let's, let's investigate this 41 and 55. Let's try to investigate these peaks and figure out where they're coming from. So the next largest peak has a mass over charge of 41. So off of our peak with a mass over charge of 69, 
Uh, this is a loss of 28. So a loss of 28 or a difference of 28, looks like we're losing some sort of ethyl group, maybe not quite an ethyl group. C2H5. It looks like we're losing C2H4, which looks like loss of like a vinyl group or something. Okay. So Okay, if we lost a vinyl group, it's not unreasonable. That explains why we see this vinyl group over here. And I guess if you go from a structure like this, you can just as easily knock off the vinyl group. Now, if this occurs and that gives us a mass over charge of 27, what other fragment are we left with? What other fragment are we left with? So this is an important follow-up process. If we break off this vinyl group, what fragment are we left with? 29, or wait. Uh, is it 44? Uh, 43, yep. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but very close. So probably something a little more complicated than just a simple bond cleavage is occurring. Um, but nonetheless, it looks reasonable then, and this structure can partially explain this loss of a vinyl group. So this proposed structure looks reasonable. Um, let me walk you through another proposed structure and let's talk about another proposed structure that we can get from this spectra. So this is our first reasonable proposed structure. The bond breaking steps make sense. The cation stability makes sense for re the reasons why each, res each corresponding peak is so large or small. Um, let's look at another proposed spectra. Let's look at another proposed structure for this spectra. So for C7H14, this ethyl group is a pretty big signpost. So we know that we have a C2H5 fragment, and we know we have some fragment of the form C5H9 with a mass of a charge of 69. That fragment then breaks apart, that fragment then breaks apart into something with a mass of a charge of 55, and something with a mass over charge of 41. Okay, so thinking about it, we are losing a methylene group each time, right? We're losing a methylene group each time during this process. So C5H9, we definitely have an alkene and we have an ethyl group connected and we want a pretty stable carbocation. We want a pretty stable carbocation. So then I'm gonna draw my carbocation and I'm gonna put two methyl groups there. So in this case, looking at this proposed fragment, looking at this proposed fragment, it's very similar to our original fragment, correct? Do these two fragments look similar? What does the class think? Are they similar or are they identical? They're resonance structures, exactly. So we can think about another way that our bonds are arranged. Now, if I join these two fragments, I would retrosynthetically 
get back to something that looks like this. This doesn't look too bad, actually. And the reason why I like this structure, the reason why I personally favored for this structure is twofold. The first of which, is it very easy to see the loss of, is it very easy to see how we can lose a methylene or a methyl group? Does everyone see how we can lose a methylene or methyl group very easily by just knocking yes. off methyls? Yeah. So I like this structure because I can almost systematically just cut off each of the methyl groups one by one and see how they are lost and gained to put back together to my original structure, right? So this is partially why I think this structure is reasonable. The other reason has to do with the fact that if we look at what happens, if we try to cleave off this vinyl group, I know that's not the best. Vinyl cations, not the best. You can see some pretty wonky fragmentation patterns sometimes. What do we see about the following structure, which has the formula one, two, three, four, five of C5H, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, C5H11 plus, what is that? So looking at this structure, C5H11, that gives us 71. So one strike against this structure is that we don't really see a large peak at 71. So that would call into question what's going on with this structure. We may not see this exact fragmentation. Um, the other potential problem with this structure is that if we lobbed off a methyl group and we generated this cation, this cation is pretty stable and this cation has a mass to charge of 83. So because these two peaks are small or not present, this structure I put a question mark next to. It's not bad. It's not a bad assignment, but it clearly has some flaws. So does that kind of analysis make sense in terms of considering your options and thinking about which structure is best? Does that idea make sense? Where you break down your fragment, once you have your molecule, start cutting bonds and seeing, do these mass over charge fragments show up in your spectra? Are they large? Are they small? Are they present? Are they not present? Because it's very hard to defend a structural assignment if these large characteristic peaks are not present. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that idea make sense? Perfect. So we have a list of options and you wouldn't be faulted for putting this on an exam. It wouldn't get, it would get most of the points depending on how the question was phrased. Um, but you, but there are clearly better structures. And the point is not get the perfect structure exactly. It's explain to me why you think your structure is correct and be able to justify it. Okay, so let's look at this example. It's almost like you're seeing an identical spectra. Is this the same spectrum? It's always a good point to start. Is this the same spectra? If we put them side by side, are they identical? No. Subtle differences in peak height distribution lead to different spectral assignments. So let's take a look at this spectra. And what I'd want you to do is to take about seven to 10 minutes. And I'd like you, and I'd like us all together as a class to work through this example, assign fragment identities and start to draw some structures. Does that make sense to everyone? Perfect. So let's start by trying to get some 
structure assignments, some fragment formulas, some identified fragments, and some drawings. This is one part of the analysis that you would have to do on a question on the exam. This is not an end-all be-all. You won't be able to necessarily get a perfect structure from this, but you can get a very good set of plausible structures. And that's the goal here. And don't be shy to type in the chat or share out verbally or draw any structural assignments that you have. The first place that you may wanna start is to look at your parent ion and tell me what is the formula of this parent ion? So we have a proposal of C7H14. I'm gonna put that with a question mark. Um, let's try to get some feedback from the class. What does the class think? And in the meantime, of course, don't be shy to start identifying and assigning uh, fragment ions as well. So we have some proposals, C7H14 and C8H16. So let's talk about this together as a class. So we see this, what is the parent ion mass to charge? What is the parent ion mass to charge? 98. 98, okay. And we know that C7H16 has a mass over charge of roughly 100. So then, a uh, mass over charge of 98, that suggests a du of one and a formula of C7H14. You can also use the carbon estimation formula by taking 98 minus two over 14, that gives us 96 over 14, which is approximately seven. Does that idea make sense? Does this formula assignment make sense? Any questions on this? Um, I just don't understand how like we can draw the most suitable structure that's like correct when it comes to like the test. Ah, so in terms of the most suitable structure, the cation stability should directly match and should directly be proportional to the peak size and intensity. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, we're just gonna pick the most stable structure of, of C714. So and then the it's not necessarily the most stable structure of this, but you wanna look at, looking at, for example, this fragment ion, with a mass over charge of 55, right? So mm -hmm. because it's such a large peak, your goal should be to draw this fragment as having a very stable carbocation. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. And I just wanna emphasize again, your goal is not to get a perfect structure, but to be able to justify your structure. And in general, the more stable your fragment cations, the larger your fragment peaks will be. 
Does that make sense? So it won't be, it won't be a perfect match. It'll be, you just want to have some reasonable options. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So let's try to assign these fragments. And I'd like both the fragment mass to charge. And if you have a proposed formula, I'd love to hear that as well. So for the 55 peak, it could be C4, H7? Yes, that's perfectly reasonable. Yep. So we have a proposed formula of C4, H7. OK. Does anyone have other assignments? Or does anyone have any proposed structures that they'd like to draw for any of these fragments? The first starting point for all of this is just getting some approximate formulas in place. Once you have the formulas, you can build on it from there. And remember, we have a du of one, so there are double bonds or rings in our molecule. And I'll give you a hint, there is most likely a double bond. Does anyone have any other assignments for any of these other mass to charges? Don't be shy to consult your table or the previous problems or to use our formula estimation equation. And don't worry if it takes a little bit. It's the first time we're tackling these kinds of problems as a group and it may it, it the main thing is to start to develop this process. Identify your fragments, get a formula, and start putting the fragments together. Can the 27th peak be C to H3? Uh, so 27 C to H3, yep, that's perfectly reasonable. What about this 29 peak? What does that 29 peak remind you of? C to H5? Yep, exactly right. That's our good old ethyl cation. Okay, let's assign these last two peak formulas and then we can start identifying related peaks and putting these peaks together. So the 41 yep. could be C3H5? Yep. Uh, so let's check. Yep, exactly right. So C3H5, and I'm just going to note this structure, this formula has a du of one, it appears. So let's list our mass to charges. So 29, that corresponds to C2H5 plus our mass over charge of 27, C2H3 plus. We know that our saturated formula is C2H5, so our du is equal to one. Okay, we're making progress. The mass of our charge of 41, C3H5. We know that the saturated formula is C3H7 plus. Remember, CnH2n plus two is your typical saturated formula. And so as a result, we see this formula has a du of one. Okay. We're, we're almost there. We're identifying each of the fragments and their du. Um, one more, 55. So mass over charge of 55. So that gives us C4H7 plus. What do we think about C4H7? What's the value for its du? 
let's just make sure everyone understands what we're talking about here. C4H7, does it have any unsaturation? Does anyone have a, a so would the would the saturated formula be C four H ten? Uh H nine. But uh C four H ten C four H ten is Oh oh right, right. With yeah, but C four H nine is for the cation. For the cation, okay, perfect. You are correct. And that gives us a DU of fifty seven minus fifty five over two or a DU of one. So we see a lot of fragments that have an alkene, okay? Let's assign our last fragment, this mass over charge of 69, which is very small compared to the, the base peak. So what did we figure out last time we encountered this mass over charge signature? What does that tell us? What formula did we encounter previously? C5H9. Yep, exactly right. We know that the saturated formula would be C5H11 plus, and that gives us a DU equal to 71 minus 69 over two, which gives us a DU of one. So this kind of analysis is perfectly standard and you should expect to be able to do something like this and like filling out a table. Now our goal is, now that we have all these formulas, our goal is to identify fragments that are related. So what fragments, when you add them together, give you your parent ion mass? So what two fragments, when you add them together, give you 98? 29 and 69. Yep, yep. So these two, I'm gonna to link together. So I'm gonna circle them. These are related. What other fragments are partially related? Are there any other patterns that we should note? What are all these peaks separated by? What's the numerical difference between these peaks? What's the difference in mass? Oh, 15. 15. Yep, which roughly corresponds to a methyl or a methylene group. Okay. So now that we have all of these relationships established, Let's now take a moment and let's try on this separate sheet. Let's try down here. I'd like to see a proposed formula for our mass over charge of 29 and a proposed formula for our mass over charge of 69. We have our formulas. Let's now try to draw some structures. So don't be shy to break out the annotate tool. And I'd like to see some students try to draw some proposed structures for these two formulas. And one of them is unambiguous. The other is ambiguous. C C2H5, I'm sure everyone could draw the correct structure for that fragment because there aren't a lot of permutations for it. And don't be shy to break out the annotate tool. You can also write the name of the formula in the chat and I'd be happy to transcribe it for you. And if you have any questions, of course, don't be shy to unmute and ask your question. So we have a proposal for C2H5. We have the ethyl cation. Does that look reasonable to everyone? What do we yeah. think? Yep, uh, there, aren't a, there is literally only one option for that formula permutation. Um, yeah, so that's pretty unambiguous. Would anyone like to take a stab at this mass over charge 69 fragment? And for this one, I'd like you to think, and I'd like you to have a sort of always in the back of your mind, mass over charge 55 is a huge peak. So it should be our most stable ion. So 
Would anyone like to try to draw a structure for the mass of our charge 69 and the mass of our charge 55 fragment? So let me just set this up. Here we go. Would anyone like to draw some proposed structures? So these are two structures related by a methylene or a methyl group. They have a DU of one, and this 55 is a very stable cation. Would anyone like to take a guess? And the more varied options we have, the better. Because this is, this is sort of illustrating how you may not get the exact structure, but you can get close. Oh, um, uh, looking at it, is there, looking at the bonds to that central carbon, is there a structure you can draw that, that has only four bonds to each carbon atom? Try moving your carbons around. But I think you're, you're breaking the octet rule, my friend. Yeah. But you're on the right track. That kind of motif seems reasonable. So let's try to set it up so we have a reasonably stable cation with a mass of 69, but not super huge. And really don't be shy. If you have a structure that looks odd, just try moving your carbons around until you get a viable structure. And really don't be shy it can advance the discussion forward. And the more responses we have, the stronger I can make this next point about varied potential structures. Yep, that's a reasonable structure. Um, and we actually saw that in our previous example, right? And this is a pretty large, that would lead to a pretty large peak. But we observe practically that our mass over charge 69 peak is quite small. Is there another structure with the same number of carbons that is a little bit less stable? Is there another structure that's a little bit less stable? Let's try to think about that. So currently we have a tertiary allylic carbocation, super stable. Is there another structure we can draw that's a little bit less stable? So what's the easiest way to make this carbocation less stable? What's less stable than tertiary? Uh, yep, we're on the right track. Uh, so those two are, these two are resonance structures, so they're identical, but you're, you're on the right track in that primary is less stable. So how can we get a primary or secondary carbocation? How can we get a secondary carbocation? What can we do? Sure, yep, that, that structure is perfectly reasonable. Uh, yep, that's, that's all, this, this, this structure looks pretty reasonable. It's, it's primary, but it's allylic. Is there another structure we can draw? I see someone typing straight chain. So something like this maybe? Uh, wait, one more. One, two, three, four. Uh, sorry, one moment. So something like this maybe? Or are you referring to something like, like this? 
Okay, so the mass over mass over charge of 69 peak is pretty small. So it's great that we had all these responses. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna rewrite these responses and we're gonna analyze these further. Okay, so let's talk about all of our potential options and let me rewrite these student responses as this is really crucial to justifying your answer. Okay. So mass over charge of 69. So it's a pretty small peak, right? So we have a few options proposed. So the first option proposed looks something like this. I'll call this option A. The second option proposed looks something like this. Uh, was there any one, was there another one that I missed? I think there was the primary vinylic one. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so something like, like this? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Like a uh, pseudo, pseudo primary in that it's in resonance with something like like this, right? Okay, perfect. So we have our list. So we have A, B, and C. Okay, so we know this mass over charge of 69 is combined with our ethyl cation, which has a mass over charge of 29. So all we have to do is just attach our ethyl cation at each of our carbocation sites. So we're just gonna staple on the ethyl group. And that in turn gives us a few viable structures to work with. So this is option A, this is option B, this is option C, and this is option D. Okay, so uh, one thing to note, so looking at each of these structures now, these would all be perfectly reasonable answers to propose. But in this case, we have some more information that we can use to determine the best structure. So let's think through and let's study the fragmentation pattern for A. Let's look at the fragmentation pattern for A and let's make sure everything adds up as it should. Is everyone following with me so far where we got these four structures from? We drew our plausible cations that were stable, but not too stable. That's why we have a small peak and we just attached our ethyl cation to these fragments. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Would the with the A uh, cation structure that you drew, would that form a resonance so that the cation would be on a secondary? Yes, yes. So you can just, you can also draw a structure E that looks like, like this. Uh, the reason why, the reason, let's, and then we'll, we'll bring up structure E. It's a, it's a bad habit of mine, but I just, re, I, I often sometimes omit structures that don't match the spectra. Let's talk about why is structure E um, not particularly likely. So if we think about what happens if we lopped off an ethyl group, so minus an ethyl group. So if we, if we lopped off this ethyl group, we would expect to also see a structure with a loss of this second ethyl group, which would look something like this. This has a mass over charge of 41. And we do see that in our spectra. The one thing that's a little odd to me is if we're lopping off multiple ethyl groups, right? Why is the ethyl peak so small? Right? Does everyone notice how this ethyl peak is really, really small? Right? Yes. Now, if we're lopping off two ethyl cations, right? wouldn't we expect, expect to see a lot of ethyl group peak signal? Yes, okay. 
So because this ethyl peak is small, this is likely not occurring, but it's not unreasonable to propose. Um, it, this, this, is, this is sort of coming down to some subtleties associated with the structure. So okay, looking, that makes sense. So looking at structure A, so we know at first glance, so looking at structure A with our spectra right next to it, so at first glance, we can knock off this ethyl group. So we knock off the ethyl group, we see our ethyl cation, and then we see this fragment with a mass over charge of 69, okay? Now from here, it's pretty easy to see how we can quite easily just get rid of another methyl group and end up with a fragment that looks something like this with a mass over charge of 55. This is a second, this is a, after resonance, a secondary and allylic carbocation. So this is reasonably stable. So we'd expect to see a pretty large peak. Now, of course, some of these other structures also have their reasonably bright points. So for example, let's talk about reasons where we can deny or refute a structure. So let's talk about structure B. What, what, what is an obvious question when we look at structure B? So we've been obsessing over loss of this ethyl group, but what is an obvious fragmentation of structure B that is missing? What, what's a pretty obvious fragmentation pattern that is missing for structure B? So we can lose an ethyl, right? But what else could we lose? Could we lose a methyl? Yes, okay, so let's entertain that. So let's suppose we lose a methyl group, we lop off this methyl group via some complicated fragmentation or just straight fragmentation. That's a reasonably stable cation, right? It's almost the same as the cation that we drew when we lost our, our ethyl group. Now, this fragment would have a mass over charge of 83, right? Do we see much of it? Do we see an appreciable mass over charge 83 peak? No. No. So it's likely that B is not what's happening here. It's not unreasonable, we can't rule it out, but it's not perfect. Okay, what about structure C? So structure C, we're just going down the list. Okay, we can just as easily lop off this ethyl group. Okay, now once we get to something like this, once we get to something like this, Oops, sorry, let me readjust here. We can just as easily lop off another methyl group. And that gives us something like this. Now, my question is, where do we go from here? Is it very easy to lop off any functionality from this fragment? No. Yeah, this is where we sort of stop. It's hard to fragment further. And it's unlikely for us to see significant fragmentation of this unit. Does that make sense to everyone? So looking at structure D now, so we can fragment off our ethyl group, but again, we have the same problem, right? The methyl group fragmentation is not heavily represented. So we would expect to see a reasonably sized mass over charge of 83 peak if this structure was operative. So of these structures, A is the most plausible and A is actually the correct structure. So the main thing that mass spectral data is useful for is for deductive reasoning. 
once you draw your structures, you can start to refute possible structures. You can start to cross out possible structures based on differences in fragmentation patterns. Now, of course, you'd stop here in most cases and another structural determination method will pick up the slack. Um, but this is just to impress on you this idea that you have the tools to solve these problems and you have the tools to really think about well, what makes this structure better? What makes this structure worse? And it's based on carbocation stability during fragmentation. Does that idea make sense to everyone? Does that discussion make sense? Any questions? Oh, um, I think someone's muted when you're asking a question. Does someone have a question? Don't be shy to unmute. Um, I, if someone has a question, I think your microphone is muted. Any, oh, oh, sorry, I see you in the chat. Ah, okay. Any other questions I can address? Uh, in, in the examples that you see, often you use max spectra to distinguish between two compounds with very similar structure. And if we don't have any questions on this, I'd actually wanna show you a typical exam-like question. The main point I want you to take away Mass spectrometry is useful for generating viable possible structures. And from that, depending on how much detail you wanna go, you can start to refine your structures. Usually you won't just use mass spectral data alone. You'd couple it with another structural determination method with a little bit more power for figuring out bond connectivity or the location of hydrogen atoms. But mass spectra does give you a lot of information and it can get you the formula in DU 100% of the time. Does that make sense to everyone? So we should be able to get to these structures in red. Which one is correct? Generally, you'll have to look at another piece of data. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay. So let's look at a typical exam-like question. So you have two unlabeled cyclic hydrocarbon samples and you obtain the following mass spec data. And I'd like you to tell me what are each of these unknown compounds? So this will be the last example for tonight, but let's take about four to five minutes. I'd like you to tell me from the parent peak what the formulas are. And I'd like you to tell me from the base peak what the base peak formula is. So does anyone have a proposal for any of the parent ion peak formulas? So you have the proposal of C7H14. We know that they're cyclic, so our DU must be greater than or equal to one. Yep, so a mass over charge of 98, we know that corresponds to C7H14 because C7H16 has a mass of 100. We know then that our DU is equal to one. So then both of these compounds have a formula of C7H14. Now, what does the base peak tell us? Let's look at the base peak for sample A and B, and let's try to get the formula for these base peaks. 
for A, will it be the base because 69? So it will be C5H9? Yep, so for A, we have a mass over charge of 69, which corresponds to C5H9 plus. And considering it's a cyclic hydrocarbon and our base peak is C5H9, it's a huge peak. What is a ring with formula C5H9? What's a viable structure for that? Let's try to draw that out. So C5H9, what's the only cyclic formula that, that met, what, what's, oh, well, let me rephrase. Cyclopentane? Yeah, cyclopentane. Or in this case, cyclopen, cyclopentane cation. Yep, that's reasonable. Okay. Are there any other options that we can think of? I mean, you can potentially draw like, cyclobutyl cation or cyclopentyl cation. What are, what are some pieces of evidence that would refute this? So- Because the peak is so big, it's more likely to be bigger ring? Uh, is so, more stable? So let's look at our fragment peaks. So what other fragment peaks do we have to work with? So we see mass over charge of 29. What does that remind us of? Mass over charge of 29? Ethyl. Ethyl. Cation. Right? Yep. So then it's highly likely that this ethyl cation and this cyclopentyl fragment are related. So it's likely that we just have ethyl cyclopentane, right? This structure for this butyl cation doesn't have an ethyl group to lose, right? And this cyclopropyl structure, if we had a cyclopropyl cation, let's just say, what's the, what's the, the first principles issue with this? Are cyclopropyl cations very stable? It doesn't match the mass over charge, cyclopropyl? Uh, well, no, they're not stable. Yeah, so there are two things. First, the mass over charge is a little wonky for this but also a cyclopropyl cation, it's a bit weird to invoke compared to a cyclopentyl cation. Cyclopropyl cations are not particularly stable. So you're unlikely to see them as major fragments. If anything, you may see fragments that look like this, um, but even then they're quite rare. So looking at this, we see this pretty noticeable ethyl peak we see this very large C5H9 peak, which most likely is gonna to correspond to our cyclopentyl fragment. So it's reasonable to assign this structure as ethyl cyclopentane. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay. What about this second structure? So we have a formula of C7H14 and a slightly different fragmentation pattern. What do we think? The base peak is... So we have a peak of 83. 83, yes. And go ahead, I, Maureen. Yeah. And I heard another student comment. Uh, please go ahead. I was just saying 83. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, I believe... Maureen, <laughs> sorry, I, I noticed one person stops and the other one starts. Uh, is there a comment that you have? Um, the formula is C6H11. C6H11, okay. So what's a cyclic compound with a formula C6H11? Cyclohexane. Yep, in this case, cyclohexyl cation. Now, what fragment, um, so this is, this is a part that's a little interesting. Do we see any, do, would we expect to see a methyl cation fragment? Is that very common? No. No. However, what's the difference between our parent peak and our base peak? So what's 98 minus 83? 
15. And what does that 15, what does that difference of 15 tell us? Metal cation. Yep, exactly. So all we have to do is put our two fragments together and that gives us a proposed structure of methyl cyclohexane. Does that idea make sense to everyone? So the base peak is gonna be your biggest help in solving these problems. Does that make sense to everyone? And generally when you're dealing with drawing reasonable structures, keep it simple. Don't start drawing weird structures unless you're unless you have strong reason to believe it's a weird structure. So in this case, in this example, it's pretty obvious that we have a cyclopentyl, cyclopentyl cation fragment and a cyclohexyl cation fragment. The one thing that I want you to take away from this example is that the base peak gives you a lot of information. And you can support that by looking at your fragment peaks. Does that make sense to everyone? Would everyone, does everyone feel comfortable tackling examples like this? We'll do some more practice on this and we'll start to cover some higher power analytical methods. I recommend looking through the examples in chapter 12 of your book. They have a few practice problems on this, but the key point I want you to, to know from this is that mass spectra is coupled with other methods. And we're gonna come back to mass spectra once we've seen some other slightly more powerful methods of structural elucidation, which are IR and NMR, which are the next two topics we're gonna to talk about in this note set and the following supplemental note set. Uh, so in terms of other questions, yes, we will be having a uh, chem at night. It would be, so it's the section, the timing that would work best for this section uh, is still gonna be Tuesdays from six to 8 p.m. And I'll be present most nights um, to answer questions. And we also have tutors present. And you'll see a follow-up announcement in Canvas about that once we have the exact time and the tutor schedules. But yes, we'll continue to have chem at night and those uh, supplemental review sessions, of course. And do you know if it'll be starting like this Tuesday coming up or is it gonna be like a while? For I believe it's gonna be starting this coming Tuesday. I'm okay. still checking, but, and I'll post an announcement in Canvas once I have the full schedule. Okay, perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna stop the recording if we don't have any, oh, so there's a question in the chat where would the methyl fragment go? Well, like a methyl cation isn't particularly stable. Um, so the methyl cation or any potential methyl fragments to be more specific, like methyl radical fragments um, would likely undergo combination or just they, 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 their, their mass is too low to be observable in the mass spectra essentially it's such a small mass to charge. And even if it is generated, you're not ever making like a methyl cation, you're most likely making like a methyl radical that then goes on to do other things. And so it's likely very difficult. It, 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 you won't ever detect a methyl cation. Or it's not even like a methyl cation fragment because during, during fragmentation, like when something breaks off, one part forms the Rad one, one part forms the cation, the other makes a radical. And the radical at least is tolerable in terms of stability. And that radical can then go on and, and do other things or quench itself so that it's not observed because it's by definition not charged. Yeah, the mass spectra only detects positively charged ions. That's also why we don't see chloride and bromide for example, as well. Does that make sense? Perfect. So I'll end our recording and this recording will